Greetings and salutations. You know what time it is. Time to get yourself all gusted up and get ready. It's another fixed blade Friday night. So get yourself that drink and get yourself some popcorn and sit her down. It's gonna be a good one. I have been looking for one of these knives for quite some time. This is a uh, Queen Bird and Trout knife. You see here it says Queen, uh, well, the Q Tool Steel made in USA. Uh, the Tool Steel is, uh, means that it is D2, and you see handcrafted since 1922. Uh, in any case, um, you also see here number 85 Sharp Fans ACSB. And uh, that's because this uh, little Bird and Trout knife was a um, a club knife for sharp fans. Now, for those who do not know what sharp fans was, um, they may not also know what um, Knives Live TV was. In any case, oh, let's go over that real quick. Uh, Knives Live TV was a, a show on uh, satellite television which sold knives. And it was produced by Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Uh, and this show basically aired on Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturday nights. And it was probably the only show on television that was in competition with Cutlery Corner Network. Uh, and the difference is, is, well, for one thing, Knives Live TV sold uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works products instead of Jim Frost products. They eventually did start selling Jim Frost products too, but for the most part, they sold uh, like Rough Riders, and they sold a whole lot of case knives. They also sold Queen. They occasionally would sell Camillus, and they would sell other high-end knives that you would not typically see, including uh, knives made by, uh, or um, knives that were, um, how would you say it, uh, modified by David Yellowhorse, of uh well david yellow horse fame um and they also talked about the history of knives a lot and because of that they developed a a fan base and uh, sharp fans was the fan club for knives live tv and they started producing um um club knives and one of the i believe this was the last club knife and that was produced by Sharp Pans. I did not collect the club knives. The main reason I didn't collect their club knives is because they never got around to doing a 5-inch toothpick as a club knife. But I do believe that this might have been the last club knife produced by Sharp Pans um, just before Knives Live TV went off the air. And that was the uh, Little Bird and Trout knife. I notice it just has a basic queen sheath. Um, this sheath is slightly damaged. I'll talk about that in a little bit. In any case, this was the uh, Sharp Fans uh, Bird and Trout Knife. And you see on the uh, blade there, Sharp Fans 2010 Club Knife. So we know what year this knife was made. It was made in 2010. So this is back in the Queen Servotronics era. Um, before um, Daniel's family cutlery took over. You also see it has a special tang stamp mark there. It says Sharp Fans US Made or USA Made. And then it also has a uh, special tang, I'm sorry, special shield, which is SF, the Sharp Fans logo. Had it been a regular queen knife, it would have obviously said queen there. It would have had the queen markings there. And it would have had the, um, well, the queen Q with the crown and the knife there for the, uh, for the shield. Uh, the handle on these was honey amber jig bone, just like you see on this toothpick. That handle material was used on all of the... Uh, Sharp Fan Club Knives. Uh, like I said, I, I don't know. I think they made about six or seven different club knives over the years. Might have been fewer. In any case, <laughs> this was the only one that ever really interested me because, uh, well, I do like bird and trout knives, as you can tell from the few that are down here. Um, but at the time that this came out, I really did not have the funds to pick one up. So... As much as I wanted to get one, I just passed on it. 
uh, had it been a five inch large toothpick, I'm sure I would have been able to find the funds somehow. But in any case, uh, once I finally got this knife, uh, I realized that it is not quite the same as your typical bird and trout knife that everyone else out there has. And part of it is just because of the build quality that uh, their Servotronics uh, era uh, queen knives was, uh, and while holding their knives, making two. I guess that wasn't the best way to phrase it, but let's take a look at uh, a couple other bird and trout knives and compare it to this. Um, this one is the Rough Rider one, so it might not be a fair comparison. First of all, the Rough Rider one is much heavier uh, in the hand. You can feel the difference in weight. Uh, that might be partly because the Rough Rider is using stag, but also because if you look there, notice the blade thickness going on there. Now, both of these blades are approximately three and a quarter inches long um, with a, a three inch cutting edge, but uh, notice the belly on the Rough Rider and the belly on the um, on the Queen. Notice how much thinner the, the Queen knife is all around. Blade thickness is less. It's got less belly. It's got a straighter edge going on there. And if you notice, we got a saber grind going on here with a nice uh, clip. Whereas this one is a straighter blade. It does drop a little bit, but it's relatively straight and it has a slight swedge running the whole length. I would not call that a saber grind in any way, shape or form. You just got a swedge up along the top. And this is more like a true skinning blade as opposed to a little clip point blade. This is much more of a, a very long clip, but a clip nonetheless. And, um, Where's uh, the other one at here? Here's the uh, one I got from Baron Son. And if you notice, this one, while it is straight or straighter, it also does have the, um, the saber grind going and a much thicker blade stock, not to mention a bigger handle going on. Um, to be honest with you, this knife, the, the Queen, is like almost weightless in the hand compared to the Baron Sun or the Rough Rider. Um, but there's more to it than just that though. Notice the pommel on the Rough Rider versus the one on the Queen. Notice uh, how it's much more stocky, I guess. Um, Again, this just feels wonderful in the hand. Also notice the, the guard on the uh, on the Queen. While it is a wider guard, it is a shorter guard, but it's fine considering what this knife is for. This is not for fighting and stabbing and everything. You just need a guard so you know where your hand is fitting onto the handle. And the same thing here, this one has a of the a shorter guard actually but when you start looking at that look at the finish going on there notice the gapping and everything or or the or the more noticeable separation between the guard and the blade notice there you can see it a little bit going here and here but not there it is so finely uh, polished down that you it almost looks like one piece unless you start looking at it very closely and the same down here if you notice see that it looks like it's one piece the guard versus the uh, the the tang running down there and notice how it blends in to the handle there. Notice you can see where it drops into the handle. Here it almost looks like it's fine until I don't know you can see it. There's just a, a better fit all around and the polish is so much nicer. Even with the uh, Rough Rider here notice the difference with the pommel.
See how it all fits there. And look up there. Quite frankly, I think the Rough Rider looks better than the uh, the Baron Sun, but that's beside the point. You got stag handles here, and you got bone handles here. You got the rounded pens on here. These these are flat and sanded in, which is good. You can kind of feel the pens a little bit here. You can feel the pens on the front side here, but uh, not really bad here. I wish this did not have the shield, tell you the truth, but it's okay with the shield. Baron Sun did not put a shield on it, and I believe that would have been a better way to go than putting the uh, sharp fan shield on there. I don't know if Queen routinely puts a shield on the bird and trout knife either. I'll have to look into that. But what I did notice is, you see up here how they have actually welded the blade in place there? You don't see that there. You just see where the blade is kind of just shoved in there and that's all there is going on. There is no welding going on or anything else. So you might say that that is a bit of a flaw there. They could have polished that down a little bit better and maybe someone could do that. But I would rather see that little flaw and know that they've actually bothered to uh, solder or weld the blade down than to see the gapping going on there where, where crud can get in there and everything. So. I don't know, just um, a really well-made knife. Um, now, as I mentioned, the, the sheath here, over the years, I mean, we're talking about 11 years now. I don't know if that's just from shelf wear or if this person before me. I bought this off of John Pierce, a um, friend of mine uh, that I've known for some time. Um, but, and I don't know when this popped loose, but it popped loose at some point. Um, I might have to go ahead and re-rivet that. We'll see about that. But I'm actually thinking I might just pop that rivet completely out and pass something else through there and um, and then just sew this down and uh, put some kind of little trinket on there to kind of remind me of the, uh, the knife and make it kind of my own. On another note, um, this part up here is kind of superfluous. Uh, I don't, you really do not need this on this sheath because of how much of a deep carry it is. Um, but it is nice that it is there. There's no way you're ever going to lose a knife from this sheath. It does have a little belt loop on the back here. Quite frankly, I would have preferred a sheath similar to this, which is the Rough Rider sheath or the Baron Sun sheath. Actually, this would have been the ideal sheath for the knife, the Baron Sun sheath. Um, but you gotta admit, the, the Queen logo on there is pretty cool, but if I were to be taking this out in the field and using it, I would probably, well, it doesn't fit the Baron Sun, but it does fit the Rough Rider. I'd probably use the Rough Rider sheath if I were to be taking it out in the field, cause uh, that's just as good, that's nice and tight. But, you know, Queen. And oh yes, the sheath is lined, if you can see there. There is a black plastic liner in there to help protect the uh, knife. I don't know if you can see it because of how dark it is, but you can kind of see it there, the black plastic liner. So all in all, pretty good. I mean, you've got a good strong rivet there, rivet into there too, uh, and three rivets on the sheath. But like I said, one of them has already popped. But the cool thing about it is, I think this blade is much more conducive to actually cutting and slicing, uh, especially dealing with opening up a small game, simply because it is such a nice little slicing blade. Like I mentioned, it is D2. There is a slight amount of flex in the blade. I would not say it's dramatic, but there is a slight amount of flex in the blade, um, as opposed to what you see and the blades that are thicker with the uh, saber grind. These have a much stronger spine, so they're less likely to give a little flex when you're um, when you're skinning or anything like that. But I don't know. Pretty cool knife. If you notice, this one was also sitting here. This is a knife that uh, John Pierce sent along with the uh, with the Queen Bird and Trout. 
So basically this was the bonus knife and uh, I gotta tell you for a knife made in China this is not a bad little knife. Um, you have a yellow Delrin like handle I'm, so we can say composition it might be actual Delrin. See the Winchester uh, shield there again I would have preferred it without the shield. Winchester logo on the blade so you've got uh, uh, billboarding everywhere on there. I didn't need that on the blade either. But you know, Queen also uh, had a blade etch on there too. So I guess that lets you know if the knife has been getting used or not. You see there a Winchester trademark USA, but then on the back side it is clearly stamped stainless China W400, what, 14003. That was her pattern number for it. And again, this one has a little bit of flex. This is a stainless steel blade. They don't say what it is. So it could be 420, it could be 440. I really don't know. But what I do know is that it is closer in style and shape to the um, the Queen Bird and Trout than any other uh, Bird and Trout knife uh, that I have come across. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, this would have probably, well, Winchester was owned by Bluegrass Cutlery even when this was made. So even though it is a Chinese-made knife, um, it was put out by Bluegrass Blue Cutlery. Um, and so and they might have been using the tooling from Queen because if you notice, the pommel is the same. And the thickness of the guard is about the same as you have on the queen but it's shorter and so they made it shorter you don't see it as pronounced but it is about as thick and if you notice look at the uh, the finishing on there that's pretty good but also if you can tell there it was not soldered down or, or welded down there's no filling in the gap there but uh the little Winchester is pretty good too. Uh, and obviously for cost saving measures, they just went ahead with the uh, nylon sheath, which really isn't a bad deal if you're actually using this out in the field because nylon, well, it gets wet and dries. Leather, it can get wet and rot. So any case, uh, bottom line is, is I finally managed to get a queen made uh, bird and trout knife and uh now that i have one i actually know what or i have a better grasp on how much uh, i feel they are worth and what i'm willing to pay if uh, another one shows up online with a proper queen tang stamp uh, and a proper queen sheath because these are uh, pretty cool knives and um you see them online going from anywhere from $75 to $150, sometimes even higher than $150. I kind of know what I'm willing to pay for them now. Uh, I know other people would say, no, I would never pay that much. And other people would say, no, that's ridiculous. You're going to have to go higher if, uh, if you're expecting to get one. Uh, but... You know, that's always in the uh, the uh, eye of the beholder what you're willing to pay on the secondary market. Um, for me, at, at this point in time, these knives uh, in really, you know, excellent condition, near mint condition, uh, never been used, never been uh, sharpened condition. Yeah, I would say at this point in time, they're probably worth about 75 to 100 dollars queen has not been gone that long uh, i do hope that um if rough rider or i'm sorry if smoky mountain knife works decides to come out with a new queen and bird and trout knife i do hope that they do not just go and make it the same as the rough rider bird and trout knife i hope that they actually return it to the original um uh, blade geometry that Queen was using as opposed to just turning it into 
a Rough Rider with a Queen Tang Stamp. Any case, uh, that's my last thoughts on uh, a really cool knife that I've been wanting to get for some time. Uh, a Queen made back from the Servotronics era, 2010, Bird and Trout knife. that a humdinger sure hope you enjoyed yourself i know i did in any case don't forget that whole thing you know like it comment share it with your friends and subscribe and ring that notification bell and thanks again for joining me for another fixed blade friday night i'll see you again soon